So the next speaker is an artist. Uh, it's Knut Henrik Henriksen. He has been exhibit, exhibited in, in major shows at Kunsthalle Basel. He's, he's educated in Bergen, aren't you, Knut? That's uh, the Bergen and Frankfurt. And he now lives in, in Germany, in Berlin. Uh, he's uh, exhibited and had major shows at Kunsthalle Basel, South London Gallery, Kunstmuseum Bern, Hamburg Bahnhof, Bergen Kunsthall. Gallery uh, Denise René, Hollebush Gardens in London and Standard in Oslo. Um, he also produced in 2009 and 2011 together with Art on the Undergr Underground, uh, which is this organization in, in London, uh, two permanent public sculptures at King Cross, St. Pancras Station in London. And that's kind of funny because when you're in London, you suddenly meet Knut's sculpture without any pre-warning. It's suddenly there when you walk in the tube, like you always do when you're yeah, visiting the city. In the, in London, hmm? <laughs> Most. Well, if you find it, it's good. So uh, welcome to Knut Henrik Henriksen. It's working, yeah, it's working. Thank you for this introduction. Um, I didn't have a title when I, I forgot to send it out, Lotte, but uh, it should be something about standardizations and doubt, also standardizing it or tvil. Um, I will show you some kind of work I've been doing for a while, uh, everything about architecture, trying to find some human character in the buildings itself. Um, I will start with a work I did in um, Hamburg Bahnhof in uh, 2004. Uh, Hamburg Bahnhof is a building that has gone through uh, lots of history and when I was invited for doing a show in that building um, you see the whole building has been neutralized you know made white walls plaster everything is just like like a museum um, so I didn't find any kind of interesting spot in the museum and that is kind of what I mostly do walking around and trying to find some character in the buildings so I walked up the stairs here I was going to do buy some books at the bookstore, pretty frustrated, didn't find anything. But actually on that area, just here, there is a very odd architectural situation. And <coughs> I started to analyze and doing some research on the building. And I find out that this is an old train station, as you see. And 50 years later, they put up this huge hall that you saw in the last image just on top of that. And where those two buildings were meeting on this line, there's a very chaotic architecture situation. So what I did, I, you can see it here, the, the ceiling is much higher and it's curved and stuff. Off. So what I did, I blocked the whole museum like this with this Nut, what's it called? Um, Nut of Jär Planke and built this huge shaped, defined of the size of the building, like a classicistical shape. Then you had to walk around the whole museum to see that kind of character. Where you see the building has a much more onion shaped and much wider. And <coughs> you see exactly on this line here, I built it. So the sculpture is actually a line defined of a historical change in the building. And I called this sculpture architectural doubt. And that has been following me ever since. Yeah, here you see the size of it. Kunstmuseum Bern, they also host a very, very beautiful uh, modernistic collection, a Rupf collection, and it's difficult to collect me because I do these site-specific works. So they challenged their own exhibition um, and a collection and inviting me to do a site-specific work in this building. Um, this building <coughs> next to it, you see in the corner here, that is an extension of the house made by Atelier 5, which is kind of related to Le Corbusier. There was kind of a uh, student of him and a group of people working with him as well. So <coughs> they made this funny, well, that is Atelier 5. They're very famous for this kind of housing siedlung around in Swiss. And this is the new extension, the windows. And again, that is kind of how I'm working. Going into space and finding a character. So in this area, I had a plan drawing. 
and I realized they have locked these windows that you saw in front here. The windows have locked. And I asked, like, well, why? what's happened here? And the technician said, well, we have problems with the condensed water. The condensed water is on the, wa on, on the windows, and it's running down into the museum space. And if you have a Picasso there and some water there, it's a very bad idea. So that's why they cover the whole windows. And <coughs> when I hear about this, architectural frustrations, I think like I want to make a monument about this mistake. So what I did, I took the dimensions of the ceiling and I cut a slice and opened the window and formulated the whole curve. So you see the temporary structure behind here and the shipboard that I have removed and articulati uh, articulating the whole dimensions of the space. This is also a sculpture that's actually a line. And <coughs> the uh, title of that one is a very long one. It's a story about the sun and the moon and a shipboard removed to reveal the pearls of water. <laughs> uh, everything is inside, I think. <laughs> Here you see a, a bit of the collection next to it and my piece also in the other corner. As I said, standardization is a very big topic for me because standardization is removing doubt. Uh, what I mean about that is like <coughs> if you're using standardized dimensions and following the instructions, you don't have to doubt that it will hold. It's kind of uh, regulated in that sense. So in some way you can say that standardization is removing individual decisions. And it, of course it was a big need in the industrial area to, <coughs> to standardize, to make these buildings like Crystal Palace or Eiffel Tower to stand, they needed to standardize the dimension to make it hold and that the people building it don't have to doubt and find out how to do it. But what's interesting when this standardization is removing the individual decisions, it's pretty interesting to see how in the art world they were celebrating the individual. In this sense, like Monet, um, and all this ism and how they kind of um, got kind of, uh, well, they say, um, well, anyhow, it's uh, something about that. Uh, and therefore, I very quick came to Walter Postmann. Walter Postmann was the inventor of the A4 format, German engineer. In the beginning of the Era, it looks like that. All the uh, different color of uh, folders, where all the different uh, ministries have different scales of paper, dimensions of paper, and I literally had to cut it off with a scissor to make it fit into the um, to the folder. <laughs> and as you see here, this is a photo I took from the bookshelf of Deutsche Institute of Nor Normierung. And you see on the bookshelf here from 1924 or 23 when they made the book in 24, you see everything is an A4. And that is kind of a gap that I kind of find interesting. So based on the logic behind A4, which is the square and the diagonal is the height of an A4 format, I started to make this kind of ornamental portrait of Walter Postman, as you see. And <coughs> this also resulted to follow up my kind of interest in the frustrating bit of uh, architecture and standardizations. When I was going to make a book, I wanted to make it, of course, on an A4 format. But the problem the printer told me, if you're making a book on A4, there's a lots of paper you have to cut up after printing it. And I thought, like, hmm, it's a bit stupid to just, like, throw these materials away. So. I decided to follow my idea. My design is inside the A4 format, and the leftover, which is normally cut off, I defined as a product space. And I gave it to another artist called uh, Karl Holmquist, and he wrote this Fibonacci made me hardcore around the edge here. <laughs> and he numbered uh, the books in Fibonacci numbers, one, one, three, and so one, one, two, three, five, and so on. So it's completely impossible to orient in this book, but it's the same thing working with this architectural volume, wasted volume, and trying to articulate them into an interesting artistic project. 
Um, when the OOR format is like A4 for standardization, this guy here is very important. That is Ernst Neufert. In um, he was a chef of the. Um, he was a student of uh, um, Gropius, and also um, I'm having so much <laughs> back problem. <laughs> Sorry. Um, he um, he was the chef of the Standardisierungen for uh, architecture in uh, in Germany. After the First World War, there was a huge amount of people that wanted to live in Berlin. Um, this resulted that they had to build a lot of building. Lots of new building has to be erected. The problem was that things wasn't proper standardized in that time. So the bricks didn't follow the dimensions of the, uh, of the windows and the door, which uh, caused uh, lots of unstable buildings. And he was the guy who invented or he standardized this norm. So he made this book, a fantastic book you have to look at. It's called Bau and Wurfs Lehre. It was written, first published in 1936. And it's a drawing, the first edition I think is around 3,000 drawings of how much space human needs in all different situations. <laughs> how much people with the umbrella and how much everything kind of uh, elevators, everything is organized. And they're still making this book today, and uh, it's still being updated all the time. It's a really amazing book. What was the title? Bau and Wurfs Lehre. And <coughs> the main thing with Ernst Neufert is that he introduced the so called octometer. octometer. That means uh, one meter is cut in eight parts which gives you the dimension of 12.5 centimeters. And he standardized, uh, as you can say, A4 is the uh, UR format. The brick is kind of the UR format in, um, in, uh, in architecture. So this brick is L.5 centimeters, and with one centimeters gap in between them, you have 12.5. And that is kind of measuring everything in modern architecture, uh, standard architecture in a way. So it's kind of the dimensions of a feet in a way. So this is his drawing of space. This is Le Corbusier's suggestion. This is actually the reality of architecture today. And this is Le Corbusier's idea. So <coughs> when I made my show in um, Gallery Standard in Oslo. I always wanted to make a sculpture based on the um, an empty architectural void. Everybody artist has to make an empty exhibition in a way. So I wanted to make the the 250 240 height of Norway, which is pretty standard. But then I went a bit further and I wanted to do a sketch about uh, Le Corbusier. 226 height. This is the Nordic aesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> this is that. So I just lowered the ceiling in standard uh, to 226, uh, and I made it with this really horrible material. This is styrofoam pattern thing that you get glue and walls that many people are using in these temporarily places to lower the heating costs. But at some point, it also looked like to being underwater, which was kind of a tribute to. Le Corbusier death in a way. And he traveled to America, Le Corbusier, to meet Einstein, to present his mathematical calculations about the modulor. And that is also the title of the exhibition. He said to Le Corbusier, it's a scale of proportion which makes bad difficult and good easy. The funny thing, or a fun fact, or whatever, uh, this is the, uh, the building he built in Berlin. And I'm not sure if he has ever uh, considered or like accepted it as it is, because the thing here, he wasn't allowed to build it in 226 height. Uh, because of Neufert, because he had standardized the height of 250. 
So this building here is based on a completely different uh, measure system. Uh, and uh, Le Corbusier, of course, was very unhappy with it. Um, <coughs> Villa Savoy, um, as often pointed out, he wanted to incorporate the car into the building. Um, I was very interested in the curve here, and I find out that the dimension of that curve was made by a Citroën 1927. <laughs> and I thought, like, it's a bit funny that, like, a Citroën 1927 shall define the proportions of the icon of the modernistic architecture. So, yeah, here you see it. That's a Citroën 1927. So what I did, I mean, like, why, 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 why didn't he pick, like, a T4? Or why didn't he pick like a Cadillac? I mean, like it's so many different cars you can make a uh, turning radius and define the proportions of it. So I went in my backyard and I took my own Opel Astra 2006 <laughs> in the car and I took the curve in the, in the parking lot, measured it, and I built this sculpture called um, Villa Savoy redrawn with an Opel Astra 2006. <laughs> And I placed it, and it's really amazing because me and my father has always been working in Opel the whole time and driven all these different Opels in my whole life. And we placed it in front of Fritz Opel House. <laughs> um, and that's in, in Rüsselheim in Frankfurt. And, uh, oh, um, yeah. And that is uh, how I did it. Like, it's like uh, I, I shrink like Villa Savoy 30% or something in that way. Yeah, and that has been pointed out many years. You should just know that this is built two years before that one or started, just <laughs> as you know. Erling Nixa, our Le Corbusianian house on pillars. This is a, um, a red house, <laughs> Rådhus, uh, city council in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Bergen. Uh, Bergen Kunsthall, they invited me to do a, uh, a project together with them and <coughs> that was j uh, through some renovation things, so I had to do something in a public space. So I walked around in the building in Berlin and again, what I find interesting was this space here. No, oh, that was this one. That was actually my main reference of working like this. Uh, I found this spot here. Underneath the, um, the, the city hall you have this beautiful kind of a gallery. So I was going to install my pieces there, but what happened is that uh, two weeks, some a month or something, before I was going to install all the pieces inside here, the building started to fall down. You perhaps uh, read about it. A big stones was just blocking and falling down, and I had huge problems, so I had to, uh, to, to, to close the whole area, so I wasn't allowed to do anything. And... Um, I'm kind of very pragmatic in these things, so I like to say, okay, what is the problem here? I'm trying to make a monument about what go went wrong. And the thing is, like, around the windows here, that is where the problem was. <laughs> there was falling bits off around the window. But I also got a very lot of attention of this, um, the, the, the sculpture quality of uh, Erling Dijkstra. Everybody's talking about Picasso, but I'm more interested in this actually artistic approach. And <coughs> I started to, based on these areas around the windows, you see the shape of them there in red. And this is his original drawing. I made this first in, uh, in the cast, uh, like um, Stöpni, also some, what are they called? Uh, farm, farm works of the shapes and called them architectural echo and placed them on the Bergen Kunsthall. And this project I kind of followed up two years later, where we made the show underneath the building. And you see that sculpture is not Naturbeton, but it's more like the bus shelf that you've seen. It's uh, with water, made with water and crushed stones. And I continue that to make uh, another work in full size. So this is the shape in uh, the whole floor. It's like three 40 high, and 
also not not to concrete hundred percent, but we did it with river stone and we sandblasted it and we did all this thing and it's now placed outside the hydro building in the hydro park uh, um, in Soli Plus. And again, I kind of making a monument about thing that went wrong in architecture and trying to make a monument about that. So where does it all come from? Well, this is my father's or that is our house actually in Chesmokoshe. And my father built this. Uh, it was drawn by some kind of architect and during the construction they started the roof on two sides. And my father of course he discovered a, c a wrong calculation from the architect. There's something going to be wrong here and the architect said no 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 just continue. We just everything is going to be beautiful. But of course you didn't. If you see the top on the corner where it's meat that is our <laughs> problem. <laughs> so it didn't work out <laughs> pretty well, I have to say. But that has been following me the whole life, my father's <laughs> frustration about like how I'm going to make this happen. And that's, that's like with this space around here as well. I mean, like it's how, how can I make it happen to make it, yeah. But <coughs> the funny thing is like when I was visiting Le Corbusier's flat, this is the first house he built for his family, it's his father and uh, family. Yeah. And <coughs> I was visiting this and it's, it's beautiful, but I just wanted to remind, when you see up in the gap this beautiful arc <laughs> you have there, I mean like, <laughs> How was his reaction when he suddenly realized that the, 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 the staircase is actually going <laughs> and, and, uh, and making these kind of funny <laughs> shapes up in the corner there? And that's going to be my next project, I think. Yeah. Perfect. Did I make it? Yeah. You did. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.